Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. I'm Jocelyn. And Jocelyn's making a cameo right now. I'm about to record week three of our new series, uh, The Rug Hooking Review. I'm a little bit behind because of our impromptu trip to the Cape, where we needed to go um, check into a hotel for a few days and swim in a pool and, you know, the necessary things that that one needs to do at the end of the summer. I'm a little bit behind. So I'm going to do a split episode this time and I'm going to look at 10 of my favorite rugs from this past week and then I'll do the next 10 in a couple of days when it's not 9 30 at night and somebody's bedtime. So enjoy the following and be looking out for part two of this week's We Can Review um, tomorrow or the next day I hope. Okay so the first rug that we're looking at here was posted in the Contemporary Rug Hooking Group by Carol Pugsley. Um, as you can see, this is an absolutely stunning rug. This is an intimidating rug. This is so beautiful and overwhelming in its gorgeousness. But let's look at how she's done this. Let's look at the post. Carol writes, finally, this peacock hooking took so long to finish. It's based on my own photo and the rug itself is 26 by 22. She had to figure out how she wanted to find that feathery look, she says, with wispy bits and decided to put in more rust color. Um, Carol says in the photo it looks more red than rust, but she had a hard time sourcing the eyelash yarn she needed, and she found it thanks to some friends, but she also says there were days when she just sat and just couldn't get into it, and she's very glad that she got back to it um, and only needs to finish the eggs to fin to, edges to finish it off now. I think that's a sentiment we can all identify with, but look at this rug. This is the product of pushing through that feeling and the problem of the speed bumps of sourcing things that you need. This eyelash yarn for beginners is known as a fancy fiber. Fancy fibers, there's, there's lots of different kinds of blends of mohair and novelty yarns that you can use with hooking. And I've never seen a fancy fiber used as effectively as it is used here. I think it's phenomenal, Carol. This is just, this is crazy. Um, you can really see the sort of spines of the each feather. Um, white, you know, with this eye, this transparent eyelash yarn on top of it, and it looks super realistic. Um, this is just amazing. I don't typically like realistic rugs, and this is, for me, still a hooked rug. It still looks like a hooked rug, but it has enough realism that it's so interesting. It really draws you in. It's not just the eyelash fibers, you know, the rust and then the lighter ones down at the bottom. Um, there's also this long yarn on the chest and on the little crown or crest or little tuffet, whatever that thing is up there. That's obviously long novelty fiber too um, that you would look for in the same kinds of places. And I'll get to that in a second. But then there's this other material right here that is non-traditional. It is not wool. Um, I didn't get a chance to ask Carol what it was, but I'm guessing because of the body of it and because of the way that it ruches, that it is some kind of silk sari, S-A-R-I, or possibly a silk dupioni, something like that. Maybe even a taffeta, but I'm thinking more like a dupioni. looks like it has a slight texture to it. It is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. And the way that the sort of like little medallions on the plumes, um, I don't know what those things are called, are, are done in wool again. It really grounds it. It's such a gorgeous rug. It's such a gorgeous pattern. Um, as you can imagine, this got a lot of positive comments. It's so exceptional. Um, I also love how Carol, knowing that this was a photograph that she took, how she framed it. It looks around the edges almost like a Polaroid with the white border and then the black corners like you would use in an old time scrapbook when you were putting your photos into an old scrapbook. Um, I love that. That is such a perfect touch. That is a real inspiration. Carol, I also love how you talk about being sort of stumped by this and taking a break from it because this happens to everybody. No matter what kind of art craft you do, this happens in life, sitting around being stumped, um, overwhelmed, you know, just t totally defeated by the thing that you're working on. The thing is to not let it stop you, right? Because Everybody hits those bumps in every area of life, and you can be defeated by a rug as easily as you can be defeated by a relationship or a, an illness. You just have to push on. You, you take your time. You, you think about it. You compartmentalize uh, the things about it that are frustrating you, and on your own time, you come back to it because 
it's usually like right the the old expression the darkest before dawn when you're feeling that frustrated with something it's probably right before that breakthrough where you go uh huh so as far as being um stumped by sources, I just want to show you where you can find a lot of fancy fiber. I'm going to click this next window and show you eBay. This is where I get my fancy fibers. I do a lot of latch hook stuff and I've been putting kits together and um, I occasionally put in something like eyelash. You see there's there's tons of it. There are uh, 6,323 uh, lots of eyelash fiber and it's cheap and it's often free shipping as you're seeing so if you're having trouble finding it locally or at a yarn store just go on eBay and just know if you are not a person who uses eBay just know that with eBay you are also you don't have to have PayPal you can um, sign up for like one-time payments and make them that way and um, pay somebody just one time without like actually having all your information in the system if that puts you off because it is hard to find sometimes and we have eyelash yarn and fancy fiber in New England at like dollar stores and discount stores like Ocean State Job Lot but depending on where you are it could be a bit more challenging to find it so Carol amazing job this is just an incredible incredible rug and again this is my favorite use of fancy fiber that I have ever seen ever I'm not a huge bling fan in rugs this is not one of those rugs this is this is not a corny novelty looking rug this is proper art and I hope that this goes to the Smithsonian when you finish hooking this it's gorgeous I have my um, I have my computer not on airplane mode sorry about that but my computer's really playing up so I want to be able to move from window to window with you and we're gonna get pop-ups hopefully they're all appropriate and I'm not getting any from a weird um, telemarketer that was not obviously so moving on to the second one this one is coming from the, the site called sharing the love of rug hooking I love this group and this was posted by Trish Rabin and she says third project third hooked project I love roosters the pattern is a punch needle pattern by Michelle Palmer named rise and shine so we're gonna do more on that later but if this is your second rug you are um, a star you are killing it um, Trish this is so pretty the colors are so pretty I'm typically not a fan of blue and yellow but you chose such different blues and yellows this is a proper cornflower blue and the yellow is not a typical sunflower yellow you've also done a lot with if you see uh, in the what is this called the crown I call this thing the gobbler I'm sure that is not the technical word uh, but in the body of the rooster in the center of the sunflowers you've used some kind of a plaid or a tweed or a herringbone some kind of not solid wool and it really really adds interest to the piece when you do that it's instant interest I love the motion of this I love the pattern I love the designer and I'm gonna to come to Michelle in a minute um, this is an amazing hooking job you, you've done a lot of details that are all your own um, and you are for, for an early piece for you you are killing it on the color wheel here you don't even need to think about the words color wheel because you're instinctively doing it and you're doing it right this is such a great composition you love roosters I don't typically love country themes but I love this so when something sort of transcends its genre um, it, it becomes successful as successful as this is so this is gorgeous and I love it for what you've done and I love it for the designer Michelle Palmer uh, who I worship and I'm sure she doesn't know who I am but I know who she is and I've been following her uh, I've gotten some of her patterns this is her Etsy page Michelle L Palmer right so if you look up Etsy Michelle Palmer is her page on the internet the regular internet if you're looking for her blog it's Michelle Palmer art dot blogspot dot com um, but this is her Etsy page and you can see I've got the roosters here so this is the rise and shine punch needle she sells a lot of digital downloads so for not very much money you can buy the pattern download it transfer it onto your backing and you're there but I mean, Michelle is just like the gift that keeps on giving it's like it's like being in a casino and it the money just keeps pouring out of the machine everything she does is amazing and there are no exceptions so I just absolutely love this I think um, Trisha's piece is gorgeous check out Michelle's page also gorgeous I I love them both okay so on to the next um, this one my computer's really playing up today so I'm gonna be gluing all these clips together later I recorded this last night and the whole thing got lost so whoo that's a story of my life 
Um, hopefully this is working. On to the next one, posted in Contemporary Rug Hooking Group by Beth Snellgrove. This is, she writes, little one for the kitchen, 20 by 30, wool on linen. Um, Beth, if this is for the kitchen, I can't imagine what's in your living room, because for me, this is like an over the mantle thing. It's so pretty, so different this. Um, this this is tulips, obviously, and you know, for me, I see tulips a lot in older rugs, like, you know, when we're talking about promo gowns in that kind of era, you do see a lot of flowers. You see every flower, but I've never seen tulips like this. Um, these are remarkably pretty and different. This composition is really compelling because it's so different. So seeing the tulips in this form, it reminds me almost of, you know, old sayings and poems about willow trees because they bend. They're strong because they bend, you know, they bend in the wind and that gives them their strength. That's what this makes me think of because you don't think of a tulip as a strong flower. You think it, it's typically a really top heavy, fragile flower, but they look so um, sort of vivacious here. Part of it's the coloring, but it's that strong composition. There's so many things about this that make it different. It's a simple composition, but it is so expertly done um, that it becomes extraordinary. There are, are a lot of comments in this thread using the word magical, and you can see why looking at this. Magical shading, magical moving uh, movement, the bending of the tulips, people say it's just magical. I think a lot of that is the mix of blue colors in the background that is making it very, very effective. It's making the colors in the foreground pop, the three tulips. And the colors themselves are exciting, right? When you think about tulips, I don't think about tulips that often because I was born in the Netherlands. And even though I grew up uh, in Rhode Island, I have lived in Europe for most of my grown up life. And a lot of that was in the Netherlands where I had my kids and um, I had my fill. I definitely had my fill and I'm back to, I'm happy to be back in the US and New England. But we were in uh, the Netherlands for many, many years, like over a decade. And when you would fly over those tulip fields, which are impossible to beat, it, it's like a, a, a nature's gift of all time, you get this view of the tulip fields that is like candy, candy uh, ice cream brights, like super, super bright yellow, super, super bright pink, super fluorescent bright orange. It's all candy, candy, candy. These colors that Beth has chosen are more kind of autumn colors a red orange, a true orange, and like a really strong um, yellow, not like a candy bright yellow, a really strong yellow um, heading toward gold. And it's so different that it makes you look twice. Also the coloring of the stems, it's not that grassy green, Kelly green, it's more of an olive green going toward like a golden green. Unexpected, and whenever you do something unexpected, including the framing of this with the light blue color being in the center and being an irregular shape. If you made that background in an oval shape, we'd be talking more like a Pearl McGowan again. This is irregular. It's giving it interest because it's irregular. If you see the way that those um, outer leaves are hugging the edge of the blue frame as it comes in, that's, that's thinking, that's planning, that's being a pro. This is just beautifully done. Also the tassels on the corner, it's just a great piece. There's so much going on here that's different. Um, I forgot to ask what you what number you hook this in because people are probably interested. It looks like a fairly small cut in terms of the width of the strip if you're a beginner. It's absolutely beautiful, Beth. I love it, you killed it. So let's look at our next one. Um, this is posted, this is Joe Fallon Azios, and this is posted in Hooked Line and Sinker Rug Hooking Club. I love this piece. She says, I made this for my sister's birthday gift. So there were a lot of comments wherein people said, oh, can I be your sister? And I wish I were your sister. What a gorgeous gift this is. And I think what appeals about this is, is going to be pretty, the appeal is broad, particularly across rug hooking groups, because it's a quilting pattern, right? It's, a, it's called crazy quilt. A lot of hookers are quilters. There's a lot of crossover there. And for that reason, I think when you're a hooker and you're looking um, at a quilt design, or if you're a quilter and you're crossing over in reverse, or you're doing any kind of craft crossover, it becomes interesting because it's appealing to like more than one group of people. And a crazy quilt is a classic Victorian scrap design um, in terms of quilting. But here as a hooked rug, it is a great blank canvas and an opportunity to go crazy with color. 
So this pattern is actually by, the, the company's called Jacqueline Designs, and it's Jackie Hansen who designed this. And this pattern is available from Seaside Rug Hooking, and it is called Crazy Quilt. So it will be easy to find on that page. It's 23 by 40. Um, but with a pattern like this, you adapt it and you use the colors that you want. Um, probably Joe was thinking about her sister and the colors she likes or the colors in her house because other versions of this that I've seen are completely different. In fact, the pattern itself, the lines don't uh, sort of radiate to the border. They stop part way. So there's so many ways you can handle this design in terms of the composition and the colors. So the colors are really vivacious and alive. Um, very happy, cottagey, cheerful colors here. You know, when, you, when you're putting something together and crazy quilt or hook drug crazy quilt, you can, you can plan as you go. That's one of the sort of liberties and happinesses about doing a pattern like this. You can say, you know, I'm gonna put in some turquoise, some orange, some bright yellow, but I'm also gonna put in some lilac, some mulberry, some maroon, some orchid. There are like at least four colors of purple I'm looking at right now. There's many blues. Um, it's just, it's a great opportunity to make this your own pattern. Um, and again, crossover patterns, whether you're looking at like, um, Connie Spaulding did one that I covered last week or the week before that was like an around the world quilts pattern that had been converted to a hook drug. These are always successful and they're always fun and they will always be popular. Um, so this is beautiful, Joe. You did a wonderful job. I absolutely love this. And again, go to Seaside. Uh, rug hooking the website if you would like this pattern it's called crazy quilt so easy to remember contemporary rug hooking group leslie knight now i did les one of leslie's things last week so obviously leslie i love your stuff i'm going to read what it says first this is a total killer also she writes few tweaks to make to my attempt at a stash buster but this has been fun to hook going to do a second one same tree but with hit or miss background i'm going to define this in a minute for beginners the pair will become pillows at the cottage for my kid's bedroom. The swirls are for my carefree outgoing daughter who sails through life. The hit or miss will be for my son who like me is quiet, contained and craves structure. So the first thing I have to say is like this, this struck me immediately as a personal piece and it is a personal piece. So this reflects your family and this is, this is why rug hooking is so great because this is forever going to be um, a metaphor for your two kids. And the reason I think it struck me so much what you wrote was because we have exactly the same situation going on in this house with my autistic son, who's very quiet and also contained, uh, likes structure, um, likes things to be mellow and not very dynamic. Whereas my daughter, who you often see in my videos, is electric and wild and a crazy firefly and giving me lots of gray hairs and even a bald spot. But um, kids can be so different, and that is one of the joys of, um, of having them around. But I love what you wrote, and I love what you did. So this is really, really different. This is a, a prim or primitive style, and this is a great example of what you can do with a simple line drawing. Because if you can picture Leslie draw, having drawn this on the canvas, uh, on the backing, and it, it would be simple, right? You've got a tree and you've got maybe some swirls in the background and the ground. And look what it has become with some stash busting. I wanted to find stash busting for true beginners. When you are doing something that you consider a stash buster, you are using up some of your old uh, leftover supplies from other projects. So like whether you call them worms or strips or noodles, you're using those extra ones up uh, and you're you're doing it in a way that you've created a project for yourself where you say, let's use them up. Like it's a challenge. Let's use up these colors and make something out of it. The term hit or miss that Leslie uses also means that she's gonna be filling in the background of the next one of the same composition, just willy nilly random. We're probably not gonna see the swirls the next time because it's gonna be a mishmash of leftover colors, leftover strips. So that's what those two terms mean. This one is a night design and I love night designs. It's so, it adds so much atmosphere doing a nighttime design and you've got that swirly Van Gogh uh, sky. I hate to say things like that because it's yours and it's not Van Gogh, but it does evoke a starry night and it is um, iconic in, in its look, particularly with the blues and the yellows. But my favorite things about this piece are the tree and the roots to the tree. 
I loved I love the stacked design of the tree. I've never seen a tree handled like that. It is so sort of art deco, um, whimsical, and then sitting with its roots, these giant roots exposed on the top of the tree, it made me think about your family, about your description, about what it means, if it's just a design thing, what that means. But I've never seen roots handled like that. So those were two things right away that really struck me. The way you've outlined it and made it pop, so good, so instinctive. And another thing I want to say about this piece um, is that having a signature on, on your piece that's visible is so important right now. I feel like, you know, I do a lot of um, work researching rug hooking because I've always been a historian and it matters to me that things are recorded. There is a huge gap in rug hooking history. Atha newsletters do a lot, Rug Hooking Magazine does a lot, but it's not all. And there is a huge gap from like the Pearl McGowan era um, to more recently with the people being on the computer and sharing things that way, there's a huge gap in between. And I feel like it is more important than ever to record with a signature on your piece or a label on the back for the future. Not that we want to think about the future because it's beautiful days right now and life can never be long enough. But in the future, you want to be sure that people are able to track who did what piece and which work because this is an original piece. And if you're doing original pieces or you're just hooking other pieces, still sign them. It will become important. Rug hooking, I know, is going to have a huge renaissance. Um, and it's just important that we label our work as artists because we are artists. Um, we're craftspeople and that is the same thing as being an artist. I love this, Leslie. It just, you know, it's the end of summer right now. We had a blasting hot day yesterday, but this morning it's fall. And I love this reminds me of summertime nights, fireflies. It's like one last pop, one last look at those good times. I want to remind you that Leslie has a site that you should check out. And this pattern is for sale on that site. It's a it's a, go onto the internet and it's hookedonnature.ca. So C A Canada. Hookedonnature.ca. This is a gorgeous piece, Leslie. Another another winner. Okay, this next piece is also from the page Sharing the Love of Rug Hooking. I think this is one of my very favorite pages. This was posted by Catherine Stephen, as you can see. She writes a small fall piece, Pumpkin House, about 13 by 16. So speaking, go, talking about going from summer into fall, right? Evening of fireflies and into this beautiful small piece. This is a great beginner piece and this is for sale, but you need to contact Catherine directly. And again, this is on the page called Sharing the Love of Rug Hooking. You can find it there and email her. She's very diligent about emailing people back. I can see that in the thread. This is a gorgeous, primitive, uh, simple, small piece. And again, perfect for beginners. Um, not so much the border, but we'll get there in a second. This is called primitive because of the style, because of the cut. This is probably an eight cut. People say prim or primitive. It means like a folk style, a naive style. And one of the things that uh, marks that style is the lack of perspective. That's what makes one of the things that makes something a primitive. And you can see in this case that there's a beautiful old time, early American looking cottage. It looks like it's from old Deerfield. And then two giant oversized pumpkins, almost as big as the house beside it. And they are connected by vines, um, which are beautiful to hook in an eight, um, and lots of mottled coloring in the background. You see some antique black, you see a lot of different browns. Um, this is also signature primitive style when you have a lot of open space in the background and you fill it with directional hooking that mirrors the motifs, for example, the house, the pumpkins, and the vines. So this is a beautiful piece to hook. A primitive piece when you're hooking in a wide strip like an eight is in some ways hard. It has its pros and cons like everything. If you are a beginner, doing an eight can be hard because you cannot get fine detail. It is not possible. Hooking something primitive in an eight is natural. It's a natural pairing and you will find it easy. You can get these vines with these gentle turns in an eight, no problem. Easy, effective, beautiful. But if you are not hooking primitive style like this and you are a beginner, I wouldn't use an eight because it's just too hard to make those turns. And with a wider strip, directional hooking becomes so much more important because the size, the, the, the surface of your uh, strips are much more visible, the wider and the bigger they are. And you need to choose a piece as a beginner if you're trying primitive hooking that 
will work with a wide strip like this piece does. So you can see the directional horizontal hooking on the house. On the door, it goes up, down, and around. On the pathway, it's kind of leading in. The pumpkins, it's mimicking the shape of the pumpkins. And then in the background, it's working with the vines in the border. This is a beautiful piece. And again, this is for sale. Somebody wrote on this piece, pumpkins, falling leaves, cooler temperatures, hot cider, what's not to like? And that is so true. This is so simple and so evocative of fall. It's absolutely beautiful. Now, the thing that makes this so different for me is the border, um, the edging, the finish. And it is a braided border with three colors. And those colors seem to be two browns and an orange that bring your eye out from the center right out into the border. It's a busy border with three colors. The braiding is, you know, the different colors make it busy. Um, this is something else. This is, an, this is another level. This is, you can buy books on braiding. I'm about to record a video on braided finishes. Doing a braided finish on a primitive is a, a supernatural look for it. It pops it like you can't imagine. And you're able to still use your same wool to make the border if you want to. So this is just an all around effective piece. If you like this piece, uh, contact Catherine on sharing the love of rug hooking. Moving on to the Woolly Mason jar rug hooking. This was posted by Nancy Everson. I love this design. She writes, just finished my fourth COVID rug designed by two old crows. I love this design. I've seen this before. I think I might have bought it and have it in my Halloween pile that is buried right now under work. Uh, if not, it's in my Etsy cart and I need to immediately get it. I'll show you that link in a second. This is for me, this is one of my favorite rugs of all time. It's called Serafina's Moon and it's 21 by 31. And Nancy has embellished it with some little bits of bling of her own by putting a button on the hat and a bow around the neck of the cap. Now, here is another nighttime scene. And when you do nighttime scenes, you are in for a challenge. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying to do it. But you need to be organized. You need to be planning well um, if you are not working with a kit because you want elements of a nighttime scene to pop. Otherwise, it becomes very dark and muddy. This pops, this pops beautifully. You can see the smiling vintage style Halloween moon in the top left hand corner. That expressive moon is done with a, a shadow color that is slightly different from the moon itself. Perfect. You've got built into the pattern, the white puffy clouds that mirror the white puffy bird, Serafina. Um, so that is built in for you. The silhouette of a dark tree also built in. So all of these things are going to help you be successful in hooking this piece. But there are extra things that you can do that make it pop that Nancy has done. If you can see these falling leaves, there's a number of falling leaves on the tree that end in a leaf pile underneath Serafina's feet. That, that is something that you can pop. Popping those leaves against the night sky also, if you look at the tree itself, the rings of the tree, the knobs of the tree, those are in a much lighter color and that's popping the tree. So when you do a night scene, as you should, if you haven't, um, try to think about the things that you're putting into it that bring some parts of it forward. You want some motifs to come forward um, so that it's not all dark, unless that's what you want. This has a lot going on in a positive way. I love this composition because it crosses over several things for me. It seems like a Halloween theme for me. It also has a bit of a country theme. And again, it's a night theme, which you rarely see night. Um, you can hook anything night, but you have to be organized and plan ahead if you're going to do it. This is, this is drawn as a night theme because we have the moon in it. I just, I, I just love this. I love everything about it. It has a fairy tale um, atmosphere. And it, for me, it's a little bit fearful. You know, you've got the nighttime, you've got this innocent little animal out in the nighttime dressed up, maybe for Halloween. There's a bit of a witch reference going on with the hat. Um, there's a bit of a, a Little Red Riding Hood thing going on with the red cape. For me, whenever I think of a red cape, I think about history books and how colonial nurses always wore red capes and how their lives were so stressful, so dangerous, uh, so busy. Um, when I think of a red cape, I first think of a uh, colonial, you know, revolutionary era nurse, and then I think of Little Red Riding Hood. So all of those connotations for me make this right on the edge of a little bit fearful, fearful and whimsical, and that gives it so much interest. This is a gorgeous pattern, and I want to show you where to get it. Nancy, you did a tremendous job here. This is the site on Etsy for Two Old Crows. And you can see, if you want to find this, it's Two Old Crows NJ. So like New Jersey NJ. Beautiful site. 
Um, just like Michelle Palmer's Etsy page, everything on here is gorgeous. Here's Serafina's Moon right here. So that's for sale right there. But you can see there's lots, lots on this page, lots of categories, PDF files, kits, wool, anything you might need for supplies. So this is two old crows NJ. Beautiful, beautiful pattern. Super effective. And here comes, I think, my favorite thing of, of all time. Um, contemporary Rug Hooking Group, Melissa McKay, finally finished the walls of the church. I'm just going to scroll down to show you this Paul Revere. Um, I've been following this since she first posted it, like as a drawing, and having just started the middle. She's working from the middle out with this for the most part. Um, this is just the most incredible thing ever for so many reasons. Because I lived abroad for so long and I was homesick for so many years, um, there were not enough pills in the world to make me feel happy being away from the U.S. for so long because I'm super patriotic. Um, and I'm, I, American history is one of my huge uh, overarching things in my life. I love this for that reason. I love the framing with the American flag. I love the theme. Um, I'm, it's, it's so close to home for me. But um, I want to point out some things before I, I, I back up from the theme and show you. I just noticed this owl in the tree. That's something I hadn't seen before. Melissa's working on the moon right now. That is coming out beautifully. Here's the figure of Paul Revere riding the horse. Um, the horse was actually called Black Beauty. It was a neighbor's horse that he borrowed that night without permission. But as you can imagine, things were a bit stressful and tense that day. In this composition, which Michelle has drawn, she made this pattern herself unbelievably. There are so many details of the architecture which are over the top. You're seeing the Old North Church behind. This is the church of the uh, one if by land, two if by sea. Um, the sexton, uh, who is the, the, care, the caretaker of the church, hanging the lantern in the tower of the church for Paul Revere to get the signal across the Charles River and be able to make his ride toward Concord and Lexington, the first, you know, the, the shot heard around the world in the beginning, official beginning of the revolution. Um, this is the wedding cake tiered Old North Church, which is a very austere church filled with box pews, filled with atmosphere. It's evolving gorgeously. You can really feel it, see it. Look at the brickwork that Melissa's done here, the texture of it. It's, it's so phenomenal. You get the rush, you get the evening, you get the danger. And sitting beside it, which geographically is not the case in Boston, these two things are in the same neighborhood, but not side by side. For this composition, it is perfect to put them this way because this is storytelling. You get Paul Revere's house right beside it. And this is exactly what his house looks like with the leaded glass windows. Remember, he was a blacksmith, among many things. Um, and the, the light in the window downstairs that is mirrored in the yellow band on the border that looks like cording. Absolutely beautiful. Mysterious is a little cat under the window. Beautiful door. This is exactly what his house looks like. And this is exactly what the North Church looks like if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, that window for me says a lot. As soon as the night evolves, as soon as you get that sky in there, Melissa, I'm going to be really looking out for that because it's going to pop that window even more, make you think what's going on inside there. You know, at this time with so much British occupation in Boston, because it was like the hub of the revolution and a lot of the loudest mouths uh, that forced the revolution were based in Boston, like Paul Revere, Sam Adams, and all those founding founding guys. Um, these were the agitators, and typically you wouldn't have lights on at night. And the fact that there's light in the window flags a little bit of danger, right? It, I'm wondering how you're going to handle the Old North Church if you're going to put a light up there too. That's a question mark. But I love this piece. For me, this is a real personal piece too because it's it's harking back to the Longfellow poem um, that is known as the most famous. American poem and certainly the most famous single line from any American poem of all time. And since nobody can hear you, you should say it with me. The poem opens with the line, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Beautiful, long narrative poem. And if you don't know, the reason that poem was written was because when it was written, it was we're heading into the 1860s and the Civil War that was yet to come. And there was a feeling in the country of extreme unrest. And all of the people who were um, celebrity type people like Longfellow wanted to be the one to write the propaganda piece that would unite the country. Now, this sounds familiar now, too. He wanted, among other poets who were famous of the day, to be the one to write the poem that told the story that brought people together. And the problem for Longfellow with writing this piece of propaganda that would bring awareness and unite was that he was writing something that reflected the times, right? The Civil War starting up and all of the founding fathers that he thought of and wanted to write about 
were extremely problematic because they had all had slaves. So this is not going to work considering history and where we are. He had to choose somebody who could be an iconic figure and the central person in this famous poem and in this important propaganda piece who did not have any of that kind of baggage that was hugely frowned upon at that time because we were going into the Civil War. And Paul Revere is who he chose. And it was a bit in retrospect of a whimsical choice Paul Revere was one of three writers that night, and he was not the person who made it out to Concord and Lexington. He did not make it all the way. Not to diminish what he did, because he, he risked his life on this night with this horse making this ride. They all risked their lives, but him and the other two riders uh, were working uh, in tandem. And this was a hugely popular and important poem. In the days before I had kids, I was a tour guide in American history was my specific area of um, study and it was the thrust of all the tours that I did. So when I did my New England tours, which was like, you know, 20 to 30 weeks of the year, I always stood my group. I would have a new bus group every week of about 50 people. And this was our first day in Boston. And I would stand them outside the Old North Church in front of the statue of Paul Revere on his horse and talk about the poem, talk about the setup. And then once we would walk through the Old North End of Boston, we'd get back on the bus and we would ride out to Concord and Lexington to see the site of the shot heard around the world. And I would read the poem like in full. And it was just, it, it chokes me up to think about it because it choked me up every week to read it. And I would read it the night before so I wouldn't get choked up, but it was hard not to because it's a huge part of our history. And this story, particularly for people not coming from New England, is important. Uh, this moment is important and it's, it's, this is, this is just gorgeous. This is a great view of a great poem, a great poet, a great moment in history, an important time, and the way that it's evolving is gorgeous. I can't wait to see, I just can't wait to see the rest of it. And I, it's got to be slow going because this is a huge piece and, you know, Melissa's figuring out it out as she goes along, but you can see there's no way that this is going to go astray at this point. You're, you're there and it's just getting better and better. So now that I have choked myself up again, let's move on to the next one. Okay, now we're moving, kind of did the summer firefly thing, and then we got a little bit into fall, and look where we are now. Feeling wintry here. This was posted in uh, Hooked Line and Sinker Club, hook, uh, Rug Hooking Club, Hook Line and Sinker, posted by Karen Jones. This is a beautiful winter scene. This is so evocative of Christmas, moving into the holidays now. This is called December Snows, and it is available from Cushing. So if you go on the Cushing website, it's a Joan Moshimer pattern. This is so, so evocative. I mean, come on, this is, I don't wanna rush fall, I'm not even sure summer's over, but I am thinking about the holidays already. We're so lucky in New England to have this, this wheel of the year, the cycle constantly turning and changing and uh, refreshing and renewing. Uh, this, is, this is so beautiful. And for um, beginners, when you look at this rug, if you look at what's being done here, there, things are successful for a reason, whether it's a painting or a hook drug, composition is a thing, right? This is, I went to school four times for art. You study composition and you learn things and you learn tricks that make composition successful. This is successful because the, comp the composition is amazing. But if you look at the way that it's hooked, that is not the composition. That is an added dimension of talent. And Karen is, is so good that she did this for us and it looks uh, carefree and effortless, but if you come over here with the cursor and you roll down this little snowy hill, directionally it's pulling us from the left into the lane, which is pulling us with a different direction toward the farmhouse in the distance. Now, when you look at this piece, do you remember that movie Christmas in Connecticut? I mean, I think that that and The Bishop's Wife are my favorite two Christmas movies. I, I'd hate to have to choose between them because they're both just such happy, atmospheric movies. But this really makes me think of Christmas in Connecticut. The composition is so strong. You've even got this fence. It's a bit of a wobbly fence, imperfect, classic New England looking fence, uh, rising up behind the tree that's rising out of the ground and then narrowing back down and following parallel, um, mimicking the line of the lane heading back, a second thing bringing us back into the farmhouse and what lies there. And you see the windows look a little bit lit up in the farmhouse. If they were, you know, black windows, we'd be thinking more like Stephen King, like, uh-oh, turn around now, unless this is a Halloween movie. Um, it's a cheerful scene. It's a postcard scene. It's a Courier and Ives type scene. It's really um, reminiscent of a Courier and Ives thing, very nostalgic, peaceful. 
makes me think about that time of year, makes me think about other Longfellow poems like Snowbound. If you haven't read Snowbound, read that. It's just a gorgeous, I think that's Longfellow gorgeous poem, but so much um, of the, the winter season is reflected in art, and this is a good example of that. There's a lot of serious hooking in here. You need to look at it closely. Um, so many, so many great tips. The silhouettes of the trees are beautifully done, too. That really helps to frame the farmhouse, just as if you were taking a photograph of the scene. You'd want to make sure the trees were out of the way and that your central motif, which is that, that house, was in the center, and that's what's happening here beautiful piece and I also love Karen that you just did that simple black border around the edge that's what you need that's all you need more would be too much the way that it's done is perfect I love it it's a gorgeous gorgeous job available at Cushing so this is the last piece of this episode and this was posted by Naomi Nicer Allen um, I posted this because we're friends from her own site and I know she's this is a work in progress for her and she's I'm getting the sense a bit more negative about it than I am because I am in love with this piece. So let's see what she wrote. There's a reason why I'm choosing this one besides it being charming and whimsical. She writes, I, a, a peek into planning as you hook. No, that's not going to be a shark at the bottom. Take a look at the sled she's got going. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Um, the bottom design started as a typical Santa sleigh, and she did that with a black Sharpie. You can see the original outline of the traditional sleigh. She did that with the black Sharpie. And then she realized that she wanted to do more of a 40s, 50s cartoon rocket type sleigh. And she did that with the pink Sharpie. And then she said she adjusted it a third time with the purple Sharpie. So she's straightening outlines. So you've got the original black traditional one drawn in and then the pink one that is an inspiration. So she did this part way. The reason I wanna show this is because, let me see if I can make this smaller so we can look at it all at once, is because it's important to see how people work. Whether you are a seasoned veteran or you are a beginner, it is important and interesting to see how other people work. If you are working on something and you do not love the way it's coming out, stop, rethink, replan, don't go to the bad place, don't set something on fire, don't be like me and overturn furniture or have to break something expensive, rethink, stay calm, rework, and plan as you go. If you have three colors of Sharpies, Sharpie on your hooking piece, you know that you're doing it right, right? This will be perfect when you are done. Stick with it, right? It, it, it doesn't all happen at once. It doesn't all happen perfectly, beautifully. You need to tweak and you need to listen to your instincts. You need to think about what's wrong for you. If something's not working, don't just keep going. Uh, don't hamster, hamster wheel it. Just step back and think, what would I ideally do? Put it down for a little while, let your instincts kick in and take you to a different place. Take out a Sharpie and change it. Even if it's a pearl McGowan pattern, even if it's an expensive pattern, take out a Sharpie and change the thing that's driving you nuts because that's the only way to get to the point where you have what you envisioned and what you want. This is your piece. You're putting a lot of money and supplies into it. You're putting a lot of time into it. It has to be right, but it is fantastic to see how somebody works. So. This, the idea, Naomi, of doing, look at the text, Rudolph Aviation, awesome. When you write something like Rudolph Aviation, you have to do a 1940s, 1950s, atomic era spaceship sleigh. You've got to. I'm going to forward to, I hope this is all right, Naomi. I looked at your page again and saw that you had put the sleigh in. I love it. With the little candy cane on the wing, um, if that's what that thing is called, the, the tail thing, and the gifts in there, it's really evolving. This is so cool. Eames style Santa. Why not? Designing as you go. You know, this one of the reasons this appeals to me is years ago, uh, before kids and when I used to have money, um, I collected artist's palettes for this reason. I had about 200. And um, the reason I liked collecting them was because you think an artist palette is an artist palette, just like a Kleenex is a Kleenex. It's not. Every palette showed me something different about the way that person worked, mostly anonymous. I only had a couple that belonged to known artists. It was a huge collection. It was like two to three hundred. But every one of them, you could see on each palette the, how people divided up their color. Did they do it according to the rainbow spectrum? Were they following books? Because I also collected art books, how-to books at that time, and different teachers would tell you to arrange your colors 
uh, in different order on your palette. So sometimes that's what I would see. The way, you know, that somebody would put down a white to blend their white or their paints or whatever their classic oil painting colors were. Each artist did it differently. Every palette looked different. None were interchangeable. And I collected them for that reason because it gave me a window into how somebody works. It's the same with rug hooking. Even if you have a pre-bought pattern, even if you've drawn your pattern and you think you're there, if it's not working out, you're not there. And you have to just accept that and think about what to do to make it better. And this is the perfect example of that. I love the way it's evolved, Naomi. I love Rudolph up there. He looks like the Rudolph from that claymation series that I watch every year with the kids a thousand and ten times. I love the text Rudolph Aviation. And I love that you switched it to uh, uh, atomic era mid-century rocket instead of a traditional rocket uh, flying sleigh because it just wouldn't look as cool. This is way more in keeping with what you're doing. I love it. So these are the things that I chose for this week. I'm going to close this out and do my outro. So that wraps up episode three of um, Rug Hooking Review. And speaking of, speaking of seeing how people work, I mean, it's... Yeah, no, it's, it's hoarders. We should have the police in here or TV filming. I'm out of control. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I really love all the rugs we chose. We did some patriotic stuff. We did some um, sort of Victorian crazy quilty stuff. We did some Halloween, Christmas. We did so many different things um, in a short episode, just 10 rugs. So it wasn't that short, but I hope you enjoyed it and be looking out for more. I really love doing this series and I'm getting good feedback on this series. So I hope you're enjoying it too, getting some ideas and getting mostly, most importantly, confidence going to try some different things, do some things, look at what you like, look at what other people are doing and just do it. Just do. So I will see you soon and goodbye from Ribbon Candy Hooking.